Your fans actually want you to have more fans and they're willing to support. They're willing to do things on social media on your behalf. They're willing to promote on your behalf and they're willing to support you financially. As long as you can craft something that's actually like valuable, there's some give to the get and you should leverage that. You should be, I think, unafraid to make your membership about one thing, one exclusive piece of content or maybe even just access to you. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. This is episode 271. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy. With me is my awesome co-host, Circa. Circa, what's up, dude? Not a whole lot, friend. What's up with you? Not much, man. You ready to drop some some knowledge today? Some truth bombs? Some truth oh, yeah. bombs on, on the music industry and one of their favorite words. Listen up, music industry. Here it comes. <laughs> Open up wide for the truth. The planes are flying over. We're about to drop the bombs. And I think you guys are going to really dig this episode today where we're going to be talking about specifically passive income in the form of membership sites. Maybe you know the the word Patreon. I think it's something that a lot of artists talk about. A lot of artists are encouraged to do by people in their circles. You know, set up a Patreon. You can definitely easily get people signing up and just giving you money every single month. It'll be really easy to do and really easy to build. And eventually you'll have a recurring revenue stream that you don't have to do anything for. Yeah. So we're going to dispel some myths about building membership sites and how easy versus how hard it is. And some of the things that we tell our clients about at IndieX, some of the things that we coach our students at Indie Founder and talk about inside the Indie Pro community when it comes to building a badass membership site like Patreon. I'm excited. Hell yeah. I'm excited too. I think this is a, a topic that is long overdue for us to cover. For sure, yeah. And we've talked about it. And, you know, I think we've just kind of scratched the surface before on the show when talking about, you know, building a minimum viable membership product and starting to sell that to your fans and how to get started. But I'm excited to talk about the idea of how to make something that really gets fans to stick because that's the challenge, you know, when it comes to building any kind of recurring a subscription product. And I think artists can take a lot of insight from software companies. And maybe this is a good kind of jumping off point to talk about here today is like what you can learn from software companies when it comes to building up your Patreon or your any kind of membership site. It could be built custom. It can be on Patreon really wherever you want. Yeah. I think there's a couple of different ways we could attack this topic, but I think that, you know, depending on kind of where you are in your in your music career, you might be thinking of this from a couple of different angles. You know, I, I would assume the broad majority of those listening, just as a rule of like odds and averages, that it is uh, not too deep into their music career, doesn't have that established a fan base. And you might be thinking of Patreon or a similar membership site as a way to monetize. But we also have interesting perspectives for those who are a little bit more advanced or have more resources. Because at NDX, we've built membership sites for people in the past. We run a membership site, so it's kind of our, (laughs) it's something we, we have to know about. So yeah, I'm excited to dive in. Yeah, me too. I think, you know, one of the number one points that comes into discussion for me when I'm talking with some of our artist clients who have either wanted to start to build a membership site, or they've been revamping or migrating their membership site, or just trying to make it better and figure out like, I have this thing, it generates, you know, maybe a couple hundred bucks a month, and I'd really like to try and make it do more than that. The first question that I often bring to the table is, well, what are you doing there to really provide any kind of value for your fans? And a lot of times what I see out in the wild when it comes to Patreon sites is some kind of nebulous idea of exclusive content and maybe some early access to things that are going to be released. And in a lot of ways, it feels very static. You know, sometimes there's a product involved, like, oh, you get a free t-shirt when you sign up and that's kind of, you know, a nice bonus perk in month one. But a lot of times in the vast majority of cases, that's where I see 
the the movement kind of stop. And so the question that I bring to the table is number one, what are you doing to give your fans value in doing this? And what would make them get over the hurdle of knowing that they're going to be paying you every single month? And then how are you going to continue to deliver value over time? And I think those are the two big questions that I kind of want to dive in into here today. Yeah, I think, you know, probably we'll be attacking this, a majority of the conversation will be centered around churn reduction, churn being the rate at which members you currently have leave. So you have 100 members, and this month, 10 leave, then you have a 10% churn rate, regardless of how many new members sign up, that's your churn rate. And so, you know, churn reduction is is a big topic for any software as a service company, for any membership based product, huge topic. But I think it's important to note that there are examples of highly successful entertainers who don't do an ounce of churn reduction beyond just putting out more content. And that's comedy podcasts on Patreon. I'm subscribed to a number of comedy podcasts and have been forever and just don't really think about it. You know, five bucks or 10 bucks a month. And I think what I get for it is like an extra private Patreon only podcast episode every week. It's important to note that that's weekly content that's like an hour long that I'm getting additionally. And I already love it because I already listen to the podcast. So giving me double what I normally get at like five bucks a month. But it is important to note because like if you can find a way to replicate that importantly, then that's huge because some of like some of the most successful Patreons ever have been comedy podcasts. Problem being is that you're an artist, you don't release music weekly, I assume, and you're not going to release double that music weekly uh, if you do. So it's a difficult dynamic to replicate. The reason that they're following you is different. They don't check in with you weekly, typically. They just stream you. You know, so it's it's a little bit different, but it's it's an important case study to know just in case anyone's like got a bright idea out there for how you're going to, you know, capture that lightning in a bottle as an, as a music artist. Yeah. I think that that's a good one to start with just as kind of a nice sort of in the wild. Cause I gave a bunch of examples of like things that I see in the wild that are bad (laughs) in entertainment. I think it is good to point out examples of things that are good. And you know, that's an interesting one because I've had experience with that where if content is your idea of the main thing that's going to live in your membership site, even for, you know, outside of music entertainment, I think it is really important to nail down something special that's going to go into this, something exclusive that's going to go into this, that these these fans, these customers are really going to want. And I, Cirque, you kind of nailed it, I think, with that one. It's like, I already consume this podcast on a weekly basis. I'd love to get more. I'd love to get the uncut versions, the extra, you know, the extra bits that I don't catch otherwise. And for someone who's really that deep into the thing that they like, yeah, that's of course that's going to be good. And I've seen it happen where an artist or a, a creative comes to the table with an idea like that and then doesn't feel like they can keep up with it. So one recommendation that I often bring to the table as well is, and this is just a talking point about potentially reducing initial churn, which I think is a real challenge. Like when you launch something like this, because it's new and exciting, you might get a lot of fans that buy into it right away. And if you can deliver on that first cohort of people that come in, that can be really, really powerful because even if you're still trying to you know, build the boat as you go, if you can at the very least deliver upon the value that you promised and then some, and I'm going to take the example of content here, right? talking about like housing exclusive content that people can't get anywhere else that you know they're definitely going to like. That's an important part of the equation as well. If you can deliver upon that, then you're going to have a much better chance of (laughs) maintaining those people and not churning them out quickly in that first cohort of people who are like, who are likely going to be really, really excited because it's new and it's shiny and, and you know, that's great. So a recommendation that I would make if you're thinking about it and you're maybe in a position similar to what Cirque was talking about is 
backlog a whole bunch of content ahead of time that you know is going to go into it. So then that delivery of value that's going to happen weekly, monthly, whatever it would be, I think weekly is a good cadence. You have that, you know, for three months, for six months, for a full year, if you can. Does that sound like a a lot of work? Absolutely. But you're going to have a much better chance of not having to keep up with yourself then and fall short. Yeah. I would say that if you take our membership as an example, Indie Pro you should definitely sign up for if you want to learn more music marketing. Um, if you take Indie Pro as an example, like probably what some might consider the core product in Indie Pro is that we have 20 different training courses on different music marketing strategies. These things get updated, but they're not recurring content, right? You could go in, you could take all the courses, and then you could just leave. Similarly, If you're an artist and you're like, I have 10 songs that have never been heard by anyone else, you get them when you sign up for my membership. Okay, people might sign up, grab the songs, listen to them, and then leave. So when you have a static sort of thing that you unlock once you become a member, then that's that's when churn reduction comes into play. Because it's like, okay, why are people going to stick around? Right. And there's a number of different churn reduction efforts that are like well known in the membership world. But one of them is just ongoing or recurring content. So if you have an exclusive thing that's like weekly or monthly, that you can use that to reduce churn. But you should know that if people are, if the main sell is something they unlock immediately, then they're not actually there for the recurring content. And its ability to reduce churn is going to be limited it's much more ideal that the thing they're signing up for is the thing that comes out weekly or monthly. And that's why we emphasize our, the things that we might implement to reduce churn are actually the things that we sell with Indie Pro. It's the main thing that we try to drive across, which is like community, access to our staff who are like music marketing experts, monthly workshops, and you know all types of other goodies that come out throughout the year. So the sort of the the static thing that you unlock is thought of as a bonus or thought of as, you know, maybe maybe a core part of the offer, but not highlighted as the main thing you're signing up for. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. You can kind of think of Netflix in this kind of way, right? Like people sign up to Netflix to watch the things that they like. And I think that this is a good example similarly to what some how some artists Uh, and creatives, any kind of creative really treat can treat their membership site is like, there is the thing that you're signing up for that's filled with content. And maybe if you've been running a membership site, you have a Patreon and you've had it for a long time, there might be a ton of stuff in there. And you might be tempted to look at that as like, oh, well, it's super valuable as it is. But where Netflix continues to keep people around is, for example, the fact that new shows are coming to it every you know, every month, every quarter, whatever it is. Same kind of concept applies here. Yeah. It's a, another primary. I'll actually just pull up a list of like the churn reduction pathways. So we've got them for reference, but another major one is community. So if you're able to, you know, imbue a sense of community in a member, actually, our one, a guy that Jack and I follow for marketing advice, Alex Hormozzi, wrote a book called Gym Launch Secrets because he his previous business was helping Jim succeed financially. And there's a lot of great churn reduction uh, methods in that book. Yeah, it's super good. Yeah, so because gyms have to reduce membership churn as well. So gyms are kind of a similar model that you might look at and try to understand what you're going to offer. But imbuing a sense of community makes it more difficult to leave because you don't want to leave behind the community aspect of it. I would say that this is harder for musicians to implement because being an artist has so many hats to wear already. And then community management on top of that and like creating a sense of culture among your fan base is not only difficult to do intentionally, but is also made worse by it not being organic. Yeah. So it's a tough one to, it's a tough one to harp on. I would say that you know, your main churn reduction methods as an artist or, or, you know, ways that you can get and keep members is to make sure that what you're selling is exclusive and that it doesn't dry up. A lot of times fans want more to have community with you than to have community with other fans. With each other, yeah. So having some form of live stream or Q&A or AMA 
on a recurring basis is I think super valuable. I follow Aries, great artist, and he does this type. He has a Discord with his community, and he has you know frequent interactions with them. And I think that that does a lot more to build the community than you know having fans talk to each other necessarily. I totally agree. Something we've been implementing recently for for one of our clients is they did a whole membership revamp last year. And I'm actually really proud of these guys. They went and took a pretty stale membership offering and have started to make it feel like a live organism that they're feeding and giving new life to as much as they can. And they're putting new content in it weekly. And we started doing, you know, we noticed like that it was challenging to continue to get people to sign up for it. Like we were, you know, we had Ascension series going in email. They were doing social media content around it. They were dropping new content in it and, you know, sharing snippets of that. But something that was missing was some of the access. And so we started talking around the holidays about doing live stream concerts within it. And it was kind of a, it was a little bit of a gamble because honestly, post COVID in my head, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'll throw the idea out there. Like we could try it. The holidays are a big season for them with merch and stuff. And so I wanted to see like, would people actually sign up for their membership, come in the door and stay if this live show, and we were kind of pitching it as a, like a holiday party, would that work? And it worked really well, actually. We actually opened up a $5 tier of their membership for a free trial so that any basically anyone could come to this holiday party concert that they were having that was only for their members, but anyone could sign up in the month. And we actually didn't see massive attrition after the fact. A number of people continued to stay. And so now that's something they're doing quarterly where they're going to theme these parties within their membership And it kind of gives that sense of, again, like community access, people show up, they hang out, they talk. And then I think over time, and this is something that varies from fan base to fan base, is when you do stuff like that, where maybe you're the center of the community for a bit, over time, the community will start to nurture itself and people will, you know, make inroads with each other and become friends and they'll start to chat together. And that's kind of cool to see. I think that's something that develops in the long term with membership sites for artists. Yeah. Another major thing that is leveraged in churn reduction is actually goes back to every marketer is required to read this book. It's the Psychological Principles of Influence by Robert Cialdini. It includes six psychological principles of influence. It's like if you learn marketing or sales, you learn these six things. If you were in college and had a marketing course, you learned them. Or if you're a fan of this podcast and an entrepreneur, you know about it. And one of them is commitment and consistency, which is that which we publicly state that we are committed to, we will remain consistent with evolutionarily because if you're wishy-washy and flip-floppy, you're not very good for the tribe, right? It's difficult to pin down what your motivations are, what you're going to do next. And so you're not reliable. So we're sort of evolved to be consistent to that which we have publicly committed to. And that's why, you know, it's better to say your New Year's resolution to other people, or if you plan to lose weight, to go tell everyone about your plan, not to like give yourself rewards for just having the plan, but to remain consistent to it, to commit to it publicly. And so if you can get members of a product to commit publicly to this life change or to this culture or to this lifestyle, then they are more likely to remain consistent with it in the future. And this is like, I'm sure gyms leverage this all the time, right? Get them to commit to some, you know, goal with their fitness and they're much more likely to show up at the gym the next day. For an artist, it's more cultural. It's more, you know, can you give them a way to wear their membership or their support as like a badge of honor? Or can you, you know, give them something to, you know, a a profile picture or something like that or an NFT, right? It's going to increase these sort of feelings that they are part of this community and make it less likely that they're going to be inconsistent with that. I hope that makes sense. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, you see this out there. I think there's a nice corollary here to, um, 
to what a lot of musicians do when they're launching, say, crowdfunding campaigns, Kickstarters, whatever, when for certain, you know, certain tier levels, they're like, oh, you get the the album t-shirt. Well, you can apply the same thing to a membership site where it's like at a certain tier, you get this token that shows that you are a part of this community. And ideally, you do something like that at every level possible that's cost effective and sometimes it even makes sense to go into the red on the first month to get that member and really lock them in. And then you make the money on the back end. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Now, when it comes to actually like if you don't have a membership, because we've talked a little bit about how we made a membership better or helped to. But like if you don't have a membership and you're planning on launching one, the first thing to consider is are you prepared for that level of work, right? It is a lot of work to run. I think, yeah, I I agree. That's a good jumping off point here into kind of the truth bomb that like this idea of memberships being passive income for artists is just a, a terrible myth. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's yeah. a ton of work. Uh, every artist I know that does a great job with their membership is constantly working on it. Just as mu- In some cases, just as much as they're working on their music, they see it as an extension of their, you know, every aspect of their business. Yeah, and and that's why when when it comes to crafting a membership, first of all, if you're not clearing like 500k a year in revenue from all your various sources, I would not advise that you don't do Patreon. I would actually choose Patreon because it's just going to take care of all the infrastructure for you. They take like a 5% fee on all charges, which sucks. You can definitely do better than that, but are you going to do better than that to the tune of like enough to overcome all the infrastructure costs of building your own membership site? Probably not. So number one is like, be okay with going with Patreon. I used to not really like Patreon so much because I was very much DIY, like do it yourself. But I understand like time costs a lot better right now. And I would say that like most artists, it is appropriate to go with something like Patreon, if not Patreon. On top of that, I would really take to heart the minimum viable product concept, right? Yeah. Yep. Think of something dumb simple that you can do. A friend of mine, Drex Carter, started off with like, all right, I'm going to have this Patreon. And the only thing you get with the Patreon is that I'm just going to give you all of my music as I finish it. So you don't wait for releases. And that's my promise that I can make to you. And he makes music like really frequently. So it works perfect for him because it's it's no sweat off his back to release it early, maybe host, you know, a live like once a month and really just accumulate members that way. I think to the credit of that model, for me, the comedy podcast I subscribe to, I never think about the $5 I'm paying a month. I never think about right. it. And if it weren't for this podcast, I wouldn't think about it. And so that's almost better. Like if they were doing all this stuff and like, come join the like, blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, check out the new thing. And like, we're having a community discussion and there's a poll and all that. I might think about it, but I don't want to think about it. I just want to support them. <laughs> right, <laughs> and get my, right. my extra podcast episode. So it's like, sometimes it might be better to just say like, to have the cell be like support, this artwork instead of get all these things, especially if you don't have the infrastructure, if you don't have a like really large fan base or you haven't achieved like some kind of viral success, we've got all this attention on you and you just want to build and grow. Then I would say like Patreon, very simple setup, very few tiers and just make your promises really small and easy to keep. And But expanding out from there, like if you do have a large fan base or you have money for infrastructure, that's when it becomes a bit more like you're going to have to create some unlocks. You're going to have to have something that you can do monthly or weekly. And so it becomes a bit more of a project if you, and, and especially, you know, if you want to charge more than like five or 10 bucks a month, then it becomes a bigger project. For sure. I think that's a really nice kind of separation between two directions that you can go. And I, just to expand upon that a little bit, I think something that is an interesting phenomenon that kind of I see and have a lot of conversations about is there are people who squarely fall in the minimum viable membership 
category. And, you know, they've kind of reached a level of, yeah, like I have a few people, I get some revenue from people who just, you know, want to support me as an artist and I make a promise or maybe sometimes they don't make any promises and it's just like kind of begging for money and we don't need to go into that too much. But ideally, there's some kind of promise that you're delivering upon. But I think there's a threshold that a lot of artists get to where if they're saying, and a lot of times they do, is like, yeah, I want to grow that. It's like, okay, if you want to grow that, one, if you have the fan base to support that, that's kind of like qualifier number one. If you have the fan base to support that growth, the next thing that you're going to have to do is switch yourself over gradually, maybe, to track two, which is adding more value, which is making more promises And not necessarily incurring more tech, but I do think that there's a shift that often needs to happen if you want to grow it. Otherwise, like, you know, if you're an artist that's sizable and has a fan base and you're still saying, you can do this to support me and that's kind of it and there's not really a whole lot of meat to it, I I think you do naturally start to hit a ceiling where it's like, why would I care about supporting you? You seem to be doing just fine, you know? Doing all right. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, yeah, it's, it's to your benefit if you're that small and you want to do a membership. I think also that like, this is going to get a little in the weeds, but like memberships, continuity products is what they're called because there's continuous payments. They're way better as a bolt on to an existing purchase. Like if you have a $5 a month membership and you can just one click add it to someone's order when they're checking out for some merch or a free CD, if you're doing free push shipping and handling funnel, that's ideal because all of the consideration to support this artist has already been done. And they're not considering something new, they're just sort of adding it to their order. And I think that that's a sweet spot because it removes all the consideration pressure from the membership itself. You don't have to sell the membership necessarily. You just have to ask if they'd like to add it. And for a lot of different psychological reasons, that's better. But it's not possible if you're using Patreon because you're not going to add Patreon as a one-click upsell to your Shopify checkout anytime soon, I don't think. Unless you already can, but I don't think you can. So yeah, so that's just to say that like uh, having a really unintimidating membership when you're just starting out is probably your best bet unintimidating for you and for, you know, your fans, especially as a grassroots artist, fans want much more to support you. They want to like give you that push to keep going. They want to see you get bigger. And so it's much more worth it for them to be this bastion of support than like, if I'm Trey songs fan, like lots of people are Trey songs fan. Like I'm, (laughs) he doesn't need my support. So yeah, I think like, if you're an indie artist, it's actually it's actually an opportunity for you to have this sort of lower stakes, lower stakes for you in terms of fulfillment, lower stakes for them in terms of costs, membership. And so, yeah, th- th- those are the reasons why I think that like for some indie artists, you can kind of have passive income that way, but it's not going to grow your fan base rapidly. It's not going to grow membership rapidly. And it's just sort of a way to monetize a little bit early. You know, it's like potentially a small recurring income stream that can help push you forward. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that that's a nice clarifier for us to make here because I think a lot of the questions, this is interesting. I think a lot of the questions that I do get about Patreon memberships come from artists and bands that have unintentionally found themselves right there like in that place of, I I built this thing because I wanted people to be able to support me at a level that they could. And now I want to grow it. So that's where the questions come in is like, okay, what can you be doing? And and that kind of led us here, which is interesting, but you're right. I agree with you. Like the minimum viable membership and making it relatively simple for you and for your fans to be involved is a really great starting point. And for that reason, I, I've said the same thing on the show. Like in a lot of ways, like Patreon is a is a really great place to start. Yeah. Something else that I want to touch on that I think is helpful here is, and this gets into a bit more into psychology as well, is I found that it works really well to have uh, some kind of inclusion in your membership that's involved with 
finding a common bond with your fans that's outside of you as the center of the universe. I mean, this can be really interesting, but the the charitable space, the nonprofit space is a good place to look for inspiration in this kind of thing. Because think about how many people set up recurring donations to their favorite or, you know, most closely held to their heart charities. And that's all centered around a common bond. I want to make sure that people in my community have food, you know, food banks, religious charities, all that sort of stuff. When you can find common bonds with your fans around things that you care about together, that does two things. One, it connects it to something more than just you. And I think that that makes people stick. So for example, one of our clients at IndieX has a membership where he donates a certain portion of memberships into child sponsorship, which is pretty cool. So making sure kids have, you know, clean water and food and clothing and shelter, stuff like that. Kind of cool. Makes it for, makes for a nice pitch. Partner with me to make this impact on the world. I think that that has a nice benefit there. But also, not only does it make it not as much about you, I think it also allows people to feel like they're doing good, you know, <laughs> feels like they're doing something for the world and not necessarily just selfishly for them. Um, so there's like an altruistic angle that you can take there. Yeah. Didn't one of our NDX clients have like a super high tier that got filled? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's the same client. That what was that tier? That was a, I believe it was a $10,000 a year tier. And it included everything that was in the membership, a ton of merch, monthly merch, monthly music CDs delivered to them, a bunch of merch immediately upon delivery, all the digital stuff that was in the membership, a house concert. And there was a number of other things. This was quite a while ago. That was a pretty awesome experience to see. Really, really cool. Yeah. So there's a book by Perry Marshall called The 80-20 Rule. I believe that's where this this factoid comes from. But in it, he talks about, you know, how 80% of your revenue is going to come from 20% of your customer base. And within that 20%, 80% of that revenue is going to come from 20% of that cohort and so on and so on. Sometimes it's 90-10, but he uses that to illustrate why it's important to have moonshot products. Using this rule, you could say that in a Starbucks, let's say that there's 10,000 customers that come through that Starbucks every month, and on average, they buy a cup of coffee. You can use the mathematics of that to say like, well, if, they're, if the average customer is willing to buy a cup of coffee, then out of those 10,000, there will be at least one who's willing to spend $10,000. And sure enough, Starbucks like sells espresso machines and they're like thousands of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And they always have one in the store because you never know when that one person's going to walk in and they're willing to spend at that level. I remember before studying marketing and getting into marketing, seeing the espresso machines in Starbucks, you know, the one, and I was like, oh, what a nice looking decoration that they have here <laughs> yeah. in their store. Yeah. So apparently they actually sell those. Like they, yeah. they move. It's interesting, you know, he and I, that client and I were talking not too long ago, probably December, I want to say, maybe November or December last year. And he was like, I'm thinking about taking that off like the sales page. And I was like, no, don't man, like keep it yeah. on there. It's, I was like, I get it. Like it seems intimidating and that like, you know, no one's going to sign up for it, but you, someone did. So like, keep it on there. Well, so there's two things, not just that if you have 10,000 customers, one of them is willing to spend at that level, but also it serves as an anchor for all the levels below it. Right. A price anchor. Yeah. Yep. So it makes the, it makes the $5 a month, you know, if you got a thousand, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month tier, it makes the $5 seem like nothing. Right. Whereas if you didn't have it, maybe the $5 would seem more expensive. Yeah. And that's called anchoring. So Yeah. Just to say that, like, if you are going to go full regalia and have your own membership site and you're starting to think about more than just a five and a 10 or a one and a five tier, that's when it becomes intelligent, wise to have a moonshot tier, one where you just pull out all the stops and you, you price it such that you anticipate nobody will buy it. You know, I'm thinking, just thinking out loud here, like kind of circling back to the the premise of this episode. And I, I sort of feel like we've come a bit full circle where we came into this to be like, all right, let's expose 
this idea of passive income, right? Passive revenue through membership. And I think there are what we've kind of discussed so far is like, there are levels to this. There is a level of like, yes, you've got, there's some ability to monetize early through simple memberships. You'll then start to get to a, a ceiling where you can no longer do it the way you've been doing it. Or if you haven't done it all, you might not be able to tap into that sort of simple low hanging fruit anymore. And then you're into this area of, you know, getting into more value driven things, um, more value driven membership offerings, tiers, perks, whatever you want to call them. And whatever that might look like for you, that could look like content that could look like delivery of merch. I know I've had artists that, you know, they deliver. I know some people that have done a shirt every month. Shirt of the month club. Yeah. Yeah. Shirt of the month. They were selling it to their fans outside of the membership, but giving it to their membership fans, which is an interesting move. I've seen people do that kind of thing. Obviously live stream concerts uh, up to things like house shows. And I would say when it comes to just tracking the idea of like building that high ticket sort of item, like dream up something that you think your biggest fan in the world would pay a lot of money for and just put it out there. Don't necessarily think about the tug of war of like feasibility. I think you should just dream it up, figure it out. Don't worry about whether it scales or not because it doesn't matter because if one person buys it and it doesn't scale, who cares? Like (laughs) you're probably going to make some money on it. Like, I don't think you're going to, I don't think you're going to price something at, you know, a thousand bucks a month and then somehow come up with a magical a hundred K worth of cost. I can't imagine that that would be the case. If I'm wrong there, you know, uh, please walk yourself right out of that. Um, (laughs) do some simple math, but I think that that's a nice way to to kind of consider what that might be is like think about what your number one fan might want to pay would pay a lot of money for and what you could do to make that uh, such a special thing for them and then don't worry about whether it's you know super duper feasible or not I think people get hung up on that kind of stuff certainly in a lot of the conversations I've had it's like oh we want to kill that because like we don't really know how possible it is it's like so like the super high ticket tier yeah you're not going to sell 10 of them you know? Yeah. Not going to sell five of them probably if you're pricing it accurately. That said, I think that you can make this mistake on the lower end and artists are very good at this. Oh dude. So true. So true. Yeah. So a lot of the comedy podcasts I follow or one of them was like, we should have never done a dollar tier. That was stupid because $5 is five times as much. And the, like the, the amount uh, less memberships you would get from the jump to, from one to five is like minimal, right? Like very few people are like, I can't go five, but if you got a one, I'll, I'm good. Yeah. Furthermore, like people who aren't willing to pay five dollars but like will settle for one are not the best like customers to have. I know that sounds yeah. kind of crass. Like it is the case that like there's that old meme of like five hundred dollar customer this like big long message about like I'm putting my faith in you and like we're going on this journey together. It's the and best like, meme. Fifty thousand dollar client is like I sent the invoice. Let me know when we get started. <laughs> like, yeah, I love that. Every time I see that meme, I smash the like button because it just speaks to my soul. Yeah, because it's true. Like the lower down, the the more customer support issues you're going to have. I would challenge you if you're thinking about offering something like a one dollar tier, just sell those fans a t shirt or a right. piece of merch. You know, you're going to yeah. make more. You're probably going to make more money on it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't screw yourself over by having a one dollar tier just because like the next reasonable place up is a 5x multiple and it's not a lot of money it's a cup of coffee every month like don't don't screw yourself over i would say that for a broad majority of artists that would listen that are listening right now just make a five dollar tier put it on patreon place it in all the obvious places where your fans might interact with you Talk about it in some social media posts. If you're running ads and you have email marketing in place, great. Add it to your to your introduction sequence of your email list so that people are aware of it coming in. Add it to your super signature so that people are aware of it with every email that you send. And just make it this sort of 
I know we said passive income doesn't really exist, but like make it this passive form of acquisition and don't blow out the gauges on it because you have other things to focus on, like growing your fan base and getting customers and like one day touring and making music. Like these are all more expressed concerns for you at your stage. If you're at that level where you're starting to think like, I need a better way to monetize than just merch and touring, then yeah, it's a bit of a different conversation whereby like most artists don't, (laughs) most artists aren't ready for that. (laughs) Yeah, They really aren't. We've worked with artists in the past where like they were gung ho about doing a membership, but when it comes down to it, like it's tough, it's a tough commitment to make. So you really want to think about ways you can keep churn low, all the different methods that we talked about in this episode, but that don't have this high operational costs for you and don't quickly become a major headache for you operationally. Yeah, for sure. And I would say like, if you are in that latter category, that is where you start to think about, you kind of start to think like a software company. I've seen how a lot of our clients that do run those kind of memberships think and talk about it and and the things that we strategize on together is it really does become you know, a product that is always changing, always getting things added to it, subtracted from it, trying to find out why people are leaving, why they're staying, what they like most. And that's really, I, I think, what can make a membership really valuable or one of the things that can make a membership really valuable and make people stick. And also, like, it makes it fun. I think when you get into the groove of it, if it's something that you actually really want to do, that kind of thing can make it really fun and creative. And it's just like, oh, what new thing can I add? And it doesn't need to be every day. It doesn't need to be every week or month. It could be quarterly. It could be yearly. A lot of people that I know look back at their membership you know, every year and they, they kind of do like a retro and they're like, okay, what are the things that I added this year that worked well? What didn't? What can I put on the calendar or on the roadmap for next year? And how can I start working towards it? And sometimes they're simple things and sometimes they're more complex. You know, if there's one thing that's hopefully coming across in this conversation that we're having is you can do a lot with a little. You can also do way more than you need to. And finding the middle ground for you and for kind of the balancing point that you're in in this kind of conversation around Patreon, around memberships, that's the sweet spot. Like that's what you want to try to find. And that takes some, I think it takes experimentation and that kind of comes back to like the work that goes into this. All that to say, like there's work, it's not passive, (laughs) you know? I, I would say that they're up to a certain level of artist size. There's this really great sweet spot because we're one of the few types of businesses where your customer actually wants to see you succeed without them getting product, if that makes sense. Like they actually wanna see you get bigger. Your fans actually want you to have more fans and they're willing to support, they're willing to do things on social media on your behalf, they're willing to promote on your behalf, And they're willing to support you financially as long as you can craft something that's actually like valuable. There's some give to the get and you should leverage that. You should be, I think, unafraid to make your membership about one thing, one exclusive piece of content, or maybe even just access to you. We're also lucky that like your customer, rather than have another song, I think, I think your fan would rather have like a chat with you, you know? Yeah, I agree. So like, that's huge. Access to the artist can be like the whole point of your membership. Actually, that's a really good point to kind of touch on here as we get ready to close out is like, if you're an artist that doesn't want to be involved with your fans, memberships may not be for you, (laughs) you know? Definitely not. I think you can find elements of a membership that work for you but if you want to be like the cool the too cool for school artist that's like secretive and shit membership eventually does come to a point where access is what you're selling to some degree yeah and you need to reckon with that if you want this to work and you know that's i'm gonna kind of dig my feet in on that and say that it's really important (laughs) super important yeah and like having a weekly show 
having a weekly live stream concert, promising to put out three new songs every month that are exclusive to your members and can't be used elsewhere. These are all things that like your fans might not have wanted in place of just the ability to talk to you and interact with you on a monthly basis. And so really, I, I think with memberships, if you're, if you're below a certain size artist, like keep it really simple. Don't create too many tiers. Don't screw yourself up with, with too low price tiers and don't put more effort into it than you need to. Cause something really simple placed in the right places, especially if you have an email list, can multiply over time and have very low churn because it's not the zip that da 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 like you're not flashing it in people's faces 24-7. And, they're, and, th- and that's what they want. They want to be able to just give you five bucks a month to go towards whatever your endeavors are. So not overcomplicating it is probably your best strategy. And in that case, it can be like passive income, so to speak. But yeah, once you get to a certain size, it's definitely like, The artists who like, for whom like the industry thinks a membership would be passive income are woefully misguided in that respect. It's like, because then you have to get really a lot more valuable, especially at scale. Yeah, so true and well said. This was fun. Yeah, I dug this. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed kind of our expose and thoughts on memberships since we built a number of them. And Indie Pro is a membership. Like Cirque said, if you haven't joined us inside the Indie Pro community and you want to learn all about music marketing and the cool strategies that are kind of at the cutting edge of what's going on in the music business, I hope that you will join us inside. We'll leave a link in the show notes. And until next time, we'll see you later, Indies. Peace out. Peace out, yeah. Really feel, feel the East Coast.